Yo guys, punk around another video. So Endgame is here. We've made it. It's time to get ready to compete on the meters. Classic is a meritocracy in its purest form. Those who dedicate and perform will reap the benefits. Warriors are by far the best DPS class in the game, so you have an opportunity here to be a chart topper. So if you want to be a legend on your server, stacked from top to bottom with the epics of your vanilla dreams, let's go over exactly what you're going to need to do in order to achieve that goal. Here's how to top DPS as a warrior in Classic WoW. Let's get into it. So first things first, let's cover talents. Before we get into any of the specifics, let's talk about the talent tree that we'll be focused on. So right now, you'll notice that most warriors are probably using two-handers. This is because of the lack of hit rating. Most warriors don't have enough hit to compensate for all the misses when dual wielding. Two-hand DPS is okay, it generally sticks around for a little bit during a fresh vanilla launch, either a fury two-handed slam spec or arms with mortal strike, but MS warriors are generally frowned upon since mortal strike actually takes a debuff slot, so you don't want too many of them within a raid at once. So with that out of the way, let's focus on the meta raid DPS spec in vanilla, which is dual wield. Fury. There's a couple DPS specs that you can run here. So there's two Fury specs that you can run, which are pretty much identical, but there's one difference between them. One puts priority into improved overpower and the other one doesn't. Most warriors will not go for improved overpower with two points, but rather only one. But incorporating overpower in your rotation is actually really good. So let's go over exactly how it's done. Then move on to the basic fury rotation outside of that little outlier. So first thing you want to do is get a scrolling combat text that will actually warn you whenever the enemy dodges one of your attacks. This way you can be warned when it's overpower time, without having to monitor every single blow that you deal and keep an eye out for all of the dodges. Now once that proc happens, it's time to switch over to battle stand cast overpower and then come back into berserker stance but wait there's a little thing to consider here when doing this don't switch over when you have a filled rage bar switching over into battle stance and dropping all of your rage from the stance swap just to get one overpower is definitely not worth it so make sure to dump most of your rage in a combo before you actually swap over and cast overpower or i guess if you have around 30 rage you can probably just swap over and it's not a big deal pop the overpower and then come back for your normal rotation in berserker stance now for the rotation outside of that just the basic fury one it's quite simple. The first thing that you need to do is always keep up Battle Shout. Simple enough, but keep in mind that Battle Shout only has a two minute duration in vanilla, so it falls off quite fast. Make sure that you have it applied onto yourself at all times. When it comes to your strikes, always use Bloodthirsts as your first priority. You use this ability on cooldown every single time over anything else that's available. The second prio is of course Whirlwind, and then use Heroic Strike to dump your excess rage, enhancing the damage of your next main hand auto attack. When it comes to Heroic Strike though, you don't want to just spam it. I see a lot of warriors that use Heroic Strike way too much. You only use it when you have excess of about 60 rage. That's kind of the rule of thumb that I like to use. Some people say 40 or 50 rage, some say 70. I've always done 60, sometimes 50. So basically above half of your rage bar, it's clear to toggle Heroic Strike. Otherwise you could dump your rage bar and miss a potentially big Bloodthirst Strike or delay it while you're building back up that rage. But it doesn't end there when it comes to dumping your excess rage. You might find this odd, but it's actually actually also good to use hamstring in your rotation as well. On Alliance, you only use Hamstring when every single ability is on cooldown and you're so far deep into your critical hits that using Heroic Strike won't cut into your Rage Bar enough to spend as much as you want to. So instead of capping out at 100 Rage and then generating excess Rage above that 100 which is pretty much wasted, you might as well use Hamstring. The beauty of using Hamstring is that it can actually proc extra auto attacks. So if you have Hand of Justice equipped, it can increase your chance of proccing that extra melee swing. Now that's pretty interesting, right? But here's where it gets real interesting interesting. Since hamstring can proc extra auto attacks, what's the next logical conclusion that you would draw from this? You probably guessed it, Wind Fury. So this tactic is mighty on Horde side. You might want to just spam hamstrings on a warrior on Horde. So on the red faction, it's actually a big priority in your rotation. This can proc Wind Fury galore, which resets your auto attack timer as well more often after each Wind Fury strike, pumping out strikes like an absolute madman. When it comes to using Death Wish, the general outlook is to use it on cooldown. It's only a 3 minute CD, so during trash, you can be using it over and over again. Although always be conscious of threat and incoming damage considering it makes you take more of it. When it comes to boss fights, there's two outlooks. If it's a long fight, over 3 minutes let's say, you can pop Death Wish on the opener after a threat has been established by your main tank, and then it's most likely going to be back up during the execute phase, ready to blast. On short fights however, you should probably opt for a different strategy meaning save your death wish till 20% when you reach execute time. 
Then it's time to pop Death Wish, Trinkets, Recklessness if it's up, and just blast out massive crits back to back to back, bypassing all of the DPS leaders like Muhammad Ali floating like a butterfly for the first couple rounds and then popping off after his opponent's tired. Now one thing that's also used at certain times is actually using Cleave over Heroic Strike. Now you might be thinking, I mean, yeah, of course, if there's two plus mobs stacked up, Cleave them. But I mean single target Cleaves. This may not apply to Classic like it did to private servers, but I'm pretty sure it still applies applies just because of the base mechanic. On fights like Veilstraz, where warriors will pull so much threat during the DPS race that it might actually pull the boss off of the tank and the flame breath will just wipe the raid, many warriors will actually opt for spamming a single target cleave on the boss rather than using Heroic Strike. If you read the tooltip on Heroic Strike, it actually generates extra threat baked into the ability itself, so using cleave as an alternative might do less damage, but it's a whole lot safer and may save you from having to stop DPS entirely or having to slow down to suppress your threat generation. Okay, so that's the rotation. Now let's quickly cover gear or itemization. As a dual wield fury warrior, you need 8% chance to hit to reach the hit cap for your actual strike, so bloodthirst and the likes. Damage that shows up as yellow. But that's not the whole story. Your yellow damage is not actually where most of your output lies. Most of the damage that you deal comes from your basic auto attacks, the white hits rather than the yellow hits. And of course, your white hits generate the rage, so having them hit is super important. The hit cap for your basic melee swings between both of your weapons is actually somewhere around 27%. This number is not attainable whatsoever. You can have all the hit gear in the world in every single item slot, and you're never going to hit that 25% chance. So the idea is essentially that you want as much hit as possible, although at a certain point, it's time to start prioritizing crit especially in the higher gear levels, but at around 12% hit, crit starts to become equally valuable and some would actually argue that it's more valuable. So if you really want to top the charts, here are some of the try hard items that you want to work hard to attain. Although keep in mind that these items have a heavy grind required, but they will take you to that next level, making it difficult for normies to compete. The first is, of course, Lionheart Helm. This is the most important warrior helm in the entire game. Getting this should be a higher priority for you than anything else, period. Not many people have the blacksmithing plans for it just yet, so those who actually have it are pretty much the only ones on the server, and they may have a crazy crafting fee for it, like maybe above 100 gold, like on my server, but it will become more widely available over time. We've got Savage Gladiator Chain from the BRD Arena Farm. This chest has a 2% chance to crit and is a fantastic starter chest piece that'll last you many raid tiers, basically till AQ40. So you might see this alternative chest piece also from BRD and not see much difference, but there's actually a huge distinguishing factor factor over here, and it's the agility. I've mentioned this a million times on this channel, but as a warrior, agility is actually a better stat for you than strength once you reach a certain level of gear. It may seem surprising coming from retail where only your main stat is relevant, but as a warrior, 20 agility is converted to 1% chance to crit, which is the lowest agility to crit ratio in the entire game. This means that the chest has over 2.5% chance to crit rather than 2%. Another example of that is this item right here called Ring of Akiria. You might think it's just 2% chance to hit, which is obviously amazing on its own, but it's actually 2% hit and 0.7% crit. Another early item that is absolutely crucial for many warriors, and again a BIS item for many raid tiers, is this one right here. It's called Edgemaster's Handguards, and you've probably seen these linked around or on the auction house for absolutely insane amounts of gold. The importance of weapon skill is incredibly immense in vanilla. Boss level mobs are considered level 63, meaning they have 15 more defense skill than your actual weapon skill at 300. Increasing your weapon skill closes that differential, which allows you to land more blows. But not only does it increase your chance to hit, but it also reduces the damage loss on your glancing blows. So glancing blow is a mechanic that lowers the damage on many of your basic auto attacks versus higher level mobs. So increasing your weapon skill reduces the damage loss on each glancing blow. Now these aren't relevant on humans or orcs, but it's absolutely crucial on gnomes, dwarves, night elves, undead, troll, you name it. Basically anything that isn't a human or an orc with the increased action and sword specialization. And keep in mind that there's weapons in later raid tiers with improved weapon skill. Generally in the offhand, you'll have a nice offhand that has improved weapon, which you should highly favor. Like usual, I'm going to link a pre-raid BIS list in the description. Check it out and get an idea for what good itemization looks like as a warrior, and just follow that trend. Okay, now let's talk about consumables. 
Warriors are probably the class in the game that benefit the most from increases in their stats. When their stats inflate, they become absolute machines. They scale harder than every other class in the entire game. They're the epitome of power creep. This means there's a huge emphasis behind collecting consumables before raid. Here's a list of all of the important consumables that you should be focusing on if you want to top the charts, but let's just focus on the core, the most crucial ones out of that list. The first is Mongoose Elixir. This is one of the most value-packed potions in the entire game. They're widely available, meaning the recipe isn't so rare or expensive, and the mats are simple to attain in 2 Plague Bloom and 2 Mountain Silver Sage to craft it. Then, the stats that you actually get from the buff itself is absolutely bonkers in respect to how easy it is to attain and the price. So you got 25 agility and 2% chance to crit, so an effective 3.2% chance to crit as a warrior. I mean, WTF mate, you get it. The other core consumables that you want to be bringing every single night to pack a real punch are also quite easily attainable. In fact, you don't even need an alchemist to get them. You get access to them after completing a couple quests in Winter Spring, which is something that I find really awesome in the vanilla. Going to slay mobs before a raid in Winter Spring before the raid is a nice little warm up or break of pace from the regular consumable farming. Firstly, we've got Winterfall Firewater, which is something that you unlock from a basic quest that's really easy to do. While killing furbolgs in Winter Spring, you get this empty flask. This item opens up a quest that, when completed, allows you to start picking up Winterfall Firewater just from straight up killing furbolgs. So kill them, loot the potions, and then you stock up. The next quest is Luck Be With You. You pick it up from Witch Doctor Moari, and she asks you to go to the southern elite spot and pick up crystals. You then come back and get the cache of Moari, which now allows you to loot echoes across all of Azeroth. The two most important ones as a warrior are the Frostmall Echo, which is what you get from killing those elite giants in the south of Winterspring, and the Winterfall Echo, which is again from the same furbogs that you're farming for firewater, so you can knock two birds with one stone, farming the furbogs to get two of the best consumables available, again without alchemy. Frostmall Echo leads to Juju Might, and Winterfall Echo leads to Juju Power. The Frostmall ones though keep in mind that you need a group to farm these effectively since the elite giants are really powerful, but these Winter Spring consumables should be one of your top priority to farm every single week. Now another one here is not something that many people are actually aware of or have access to right now considering that the plans to make this one drop in Molten Core and are quite rare to see. It's the elemental sharpening stones that you can craft after getting the recipe from many of the bosses in Molten Core. It's pretty easy to make, you only need 3 dense stones and 2 elemental earth to craft one. What makes the supply low however is the fact that not many people actually have the recipe. So you want to find somebody who's got it or someone in your guild, keep them on your friends list and have them make them for you whenever available. But these are absolutely insane, 2% chance to crit buff that you apply onto your weapon. And since you're dual wielding, a nice 4% chance to crit from your weapon sharpening on alliance side. Horde obviously will only put this on their offhand since they want wind fury on the main hand, and the buff would actually override the wind fury application to your weapon, similar to poisons. So those are the most important consumables, but dig a little bit deeper in the list that I linked because that's just the surface. There's actually a lot more that you can get, like roids for example from a quest in the Badlands. Now when it comes to world buffs, this is something that's again super important on a warrior considering you benefit from stat increases once again more than anyone else. Most world buffs are generally acquired as a guild, so you don't have to worry about it so much from a personal perspective. Just tag along the guild plans and get the buffs that everyone's getting. But there is one really important world buff which you can actually attain yourself without help from the guild whatsoever, and that's Songflower Serenade. All you have to do to attain this one is head out to Felwood, find one of those Songflower flowers, click it, and then you get the buff. Although, consider this, that I've read from old comments back in vanilla in 2005 and 2006, this personally hasn't ever happened to me, that it can actually resist when casted onto you, meaning you'll resist the application of the flower, and that's a big ol' rip. But check it out, it's got a 5% chance to crit and a 15% to all stats increase. So that's almost 6% chance to crit increase on a warrior. Insane considering the increased rage generation from crits. Get this whenever you can, and you're definitely gonna set yourself apart from the pack, although watch your threat, especially if your main tank doesn't have any world buffs and you're coming in with Songflower. Alright, so before we end, let's go over a couple general tips that might help you in your quest to top the charts in your raid. The first is Keybinds. You want to keybind your abilities consciously. Map your cleave and heroic strike to something that you can hit effortlessly while spamming your main rotation, meaning that you can combo heroic strikes with bloodthirst let's say for example in the exact same second without having to force your hand in an awkward position. 
for instance, my Bloodthirst is 3 and then my Heroic Strike is Q, I can easily pop them both off with two fingers, without having to stretch my hand out at all. When it comes to other combo abilities like cooldown pops, consider putting them onto your mouse, like Sweeping Strikes, Death Wish, Trinket Pops. Having your mouse to click those while your left hand is keeping up with your attack rotation is really nice, allowing you to pop those buffs without interfering with your left hand at all that's casting all of your abilities. Another thing is saving your blood rage if the timing applies for boosting your rage pool when you get empty during the execute phase, and obviously using bloodthirst on cooldown when you're fighting the boss. Another one is focus on uptime. This is the most important thing to topping DPS as a warrior, constantly sticking on the right target and switching off quickly to the next mob without any delay. Uptime is key on a warrior, or on melee in general. And lastly, macro auto attack start attack functions into your rotation, meaning if you're out of rage and you're spamming bloodthirst, your character won't just stand there awkwardly, not attacking or striking for a couple seconds till you manually trigger your auto attack. So if you're out of rage and you're spamming bloodthirst, your autos will start regardless of whether or not the strike is going off. Alright fellas, that's it for this one. I really hope you enjoyed it like usual. Warriors are a class that can absolutely blow up on the charts if you follow this model. So if you want to be an elite warrior, put in the work and you'll fly past the lesser plebeians who can't keep up with your no life try hard nature. If you're a warrior, I'm secretly jealous of you and most likely I'll be re-rolling to one at some point during classic. That's pretty much all I got to say on this one. If you like my content and want to see more videos like this, make sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, of course, you know the drill soldiers. Hit the notification bell to be notified every single time I post a new video fresh out of the render oven. Follow my Twitch, join the discord. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.